I'm Rob Lacuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Oscar and Emmy-winning production designer Martin Childs. Martin, first of all, Season 5 of The Crown sees the royal family facing more contemporary challenges as a series moves into the modern era. So looking back on pre-production, what were the main priorities for the art department? Well, actually, it was a it was a unique experience, season five, because I I, um, I designed a lot of it in isolation during COVID. So I was uh, for normally it's much much more collaborative. So the collaboration came uh, via Zoom calls, came via sending couriers out with drawings to to directors. Um, so it was a very very different experience. And actually, weirdly, the the um, I know. The, COVID was a ghastly thing for a lot of people, but it it worked um, it worked in my favour when it comes to designing the crown because it meant I could actually have time at my desk drawing stuff, uh, which is a rare rare uh, treat. And uh, uh, so I was able to do that and uh, break down the scripts in in a in a very very detailed and forensic way. And therefore, that that was a, a new experience to me, uh, which is just as well because there are an awful lot of sets, and I think probably more in season five than there have ever been before, involving an awful lot of um, uh, travel, um, yeah. an awful lot of at least travel in terms of what you see on the screen, uh, but not necessarily travel in terms of us going to shoot it. So, for example, um, the whole of in Patty of House, we never left the country, even though we did Russia, we did England a hundred years ago. Um, a, lot, a lot of it was done in um, on sets at L Street Studios. Wow. And, um, and also um, in North Yorkshire, we never had to go further than North Yorkshire. So a couple of hundred miles and that was it. Um, so that, that uh, kind of, that was one of them. That was one of my favorite things. That was the things I'd like to boast about the most. <laughs> was, was we, we, we achieved the whole of the patty of house without ever leaving the country and similarly yeah. with uh, the whole of the egyptian sequence the whole of um, the life of muhammad al-fayed the early life of muhammad al-fayed there are a lot of things that we had to consider during that that uh involved going no further than spain so yeah it was wow. um it was extremely uh looking back on it it was extremely satisfying i can only imagine uh, over five seasons the amount the amount of sets that you've uh, designed and had constructed and the amount of and the locations that you've been able to utilize mm. are just breathtaking. And in a party of house, it's episode mm. six, I think. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You had, I mean, such a, you're so spoiled for choice over season five, but I think this is the highlight episode for the art department, mm. but from a design standpoint. The, um, Thank you. I, I, and I think you worked alongside Mark Reggett and Alice Harvey and, um, I just wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into it, actually, because it opens in London, 1917. It is so immersive because London's mm. uh, it, it's portrayed as really grimy and crowded. And that's right. It's still ornate, but you've made adjustments to it to bring it back to that wartime period. So talk me through that challenge. Well, the, the first challenge is always that, you know, you're going to not remain on these sets for too long. Something is always happening. Um, there are certain sets, there are certain rooms in Buckingham Palace where we spend time in and there is dialogue. But there, there, otherwise we have to paint a picture um, with a fairly broad brush. So the, the street in London with the bomb craters and everything, we knew we weren't going to linger on that for too long. And it's one of those strange paradoxes, you know, where, where it's probably an eighth of a page but, uh, of, of a script, but at the same time it needs to be... Uh, it needs to be something big. It needs to be something that people will recognize instantly as a world they've never been to before. So what I wanted to do in that time was recognize places because we've got a different queen. We've got, um, we've got Queen Mary. Um, we've, I wanted to recognize um, sets that we've known from the crown forever, but at the same time, what they were like a hundred years ago. So I think it was important for people to know that it's the same uh, continuity through the same royal family in the same places, but um, in a in a different uh, different cultural world, a different um, yeah. time frame. Yeah, uh, that's comforting because because it, it gives us that continuity, but then it also gives us the uh, the impression that we have moved back in time, which is obviously so important. Then the scene mm. in Russia, 
uh, with the Romanovs, so gut-wrenching. Um, obviously, a party of house, if anyone's not aware of it, they should read up on it. It's a fascinating mm. story. Mm. That dark dungeon-like set representing the old house in Yekaterinburg, where Emperor Nicholas mm. uh, II um, and his family and members of even his household were executed. It's horrifying. Yeah. So what were you horrifying. designing that? Well, we built that from the ground up. We built the whole wow. of that basement and um, just for that purpose. Because, I mean, for, for there are logistical reasons, you don't want to go into somebody's house and say, we want to murder a family here and we want to have explosions in the walls and we want to do, uh, we want to cover your walls in blood and that kind of thing. I mean, that, that sounds a glib thing to say, but at the same time, you don't want to do all that on location and you want to have control of it and it's going to take time and you want to sort of isolate those moments. Um, therefore, um, we needed to build that thing and looking at the research it was quite it was a much smaller basement but at the same time we part of our narrative was that they thought they were being taken down there to have their photograph taken and therefore it needed to be initially photogenic and then become horrific as the story became horrific so so building it seemed to be an essential part of the narrative the other thing is that it had to be um continuous with uh, the upstairs, part of which was a set at uh, Elstree Studios, part of which was a house in North Yorkshire. So all of those things needed to kind of link together in, a, in an invisible way so that you watching it think you are in the one place. Yeah. Um, so it was, it, it was important. The, the other thing was, you know, that the, there were other logistical things like once you've um, once you've done an awful lot of destruction in a set, then you need to go to take two, you then need to replace the walls. I mean, simple, simple things like that. So those are the kind of banal and simple things that you have to take into consideration. But at the same time, you want to build it, build a sort of um, mood and um, atmosphere into, into the set. Uh, and that's yeah. something that you can only achieve. Um, with that level of set uh, on, the, um, on, 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 on a set in uh, the studios. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm. Then the Queen Elizabeth um, goes to Russia um, in the present mm. day. And mm. um, she, goes that, to, she goes to Brad, Bradford, further south of Yorkshire. Unbelievable. <laughs> so many opportunities for you to really, uh, this is where I think, when, some, when people say the Crown's attention to detail is second to none, it's that scene mm. in that banquet hall where I was mm. gobsmacked. Talk me through yeah. designing that. Well, thank you. There's, an, there's a, a huge empty house called Wentworth Woodhouse. We went there to have a look at it in season one to see if it could conceivably be our Buckingham Palace. Um, it couldn't. Uh, it couldn't play that part. Um, it needed to be... Um, it needed to be kind of kept in our back pockets for a special occasion. And the special occasion proved to be um, um, uh, the Kremlin. And so when we went to, we, we've, um, I suppose the initial thing, the house is empty. The house um, is currently just beginning to be open to the public. Um, it used, it was built on the fortunes of coal mining industry. It was then discovered that um, the land underneath it was, there was, it was, it was subject to subsidence because of all the coal mining that had gone on in the district. So it was a perfect kind of, I, I hesitate to use the word blank canvas because it's far from blank. Um, but it's, uh, it is, it, it, from a country house point of view, a blank canvas because we were able to do things to it, that whatever we want to do, pretty much. Um, so what the, the, the key to, for me was that extraordinary geometric flaw and so I just we just built the whole of our um, the whole of our banquet around the geometry of that floor in order to the, the tiled floor in order to to sort of say something about the wealth of uh, of, of Russia um, because we also needed to live up to some previous dialogue where where the president had said something uh, rude about Buckingham Palace <laughs> and said that he's got he's got better palaces back in Russia. So we needed for there to be some better palaces back in Russia. Um, the other thing was the, the, the two doors down from that um, from that room, two rooms down, was the room that we turned into um, the bedroom for uh, Philip and Elizabeth to have their massive dialogue scene. Um, and that was a long scene in Crown terms, um, a long dialogue scene. 
and it needed therefore to contain some 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 massive emotional baggage mm -hmm. um and also tell you that they weren't they weren't at home they weren't at home with each other they weren't literally at home they were somewhere else somewhere that gave them um license in a way to say the kinds of things that they couldn't say when they were at home yeah that's oh that's huge i never really considered that but that's really important mm. um talking about season five generally i it's so clear that you have such a real affection for the sets utilized for the britannia uh, and I was, <laughs> so, I was wondering if that was ever going to come up on the show and it did um so what about yeah. that was that exciting for you to be able to design and construct that it was an absolute thrill it was it was so exciting um what was what made it the, the biggest challenge was the fact that we only had a certain amount of space to do it in. Um, so we, it, it is in fact spread over I think six built sets and two and a half locations, something like that. I haven't got the actual statistics with me, but it is spread over a good number of different uh, different places. Some of which we built, some of which we found on location. For example, the uh, the uh, the whole sort of. Uh, the lower decks where Philip goes in search of uh, an errant noise um, is um, shot on location in, I think that was HMS Belfast. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a lot of sort of below deck stuff, but all of the above deck stuff and all of the um, sort of bedroom decks um, and the cabin decks and the dining room and the drawing room all of those we built in various on various stages at Elstree Studios and built little corridors off them to look as if they could lead to the locations so the whole thing was it was quite a lot about about connecting these various things and also the other thing we did was um is something that it was it was fairly subtle and when you go to look at real Britannia you the rooms are quite rectangular but I wanted the audience and the actors acting within it to know that it was actually a ship. So we slightly exaggerated the height of the ceilings. We made them lower, so you knew you weren't in a palace. And we um, made the sets rather more uh, pointy rather than rectangular, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so there was, a, there was an oddness to their shape, which I think lent, um, so that people were reminded they were at sea, really. Yes. Uh, both the audience and the actors within the set. You know, you saying that just reminds me, it's a, actually a good segue to this question about um, historical accuracy, because The Crown is not a documentary. It's a drama and it's, you know, it's a fly on the wall. It's what if, so to speak, or what, you know, what might have happened. How, so mm. how tied are you to real life footage and photos and video? Or are you allowed to have some artistic license, just like, the creative team generally does for the show? Well, I, I, I like my artistic license to be about the storytelling, um, yeah. to be about accommodating uh, filmmaking, really. So um, it's it's kind of, it's, it's narrative led because um, let's say, I, I think we got into the late 1900s. Um, I don't mean date terms, I mean the number of sets. We've almost hit two. By the time we get to the end of season five, we've almost hit two thousand sets, and I'm giving you this preamble just because uh, all of these sets need to look different from one another. Yeah. Um, so people need to know that they're moving about. People need to know that they're somewhere else, and therefore my my license is part of what gives me um, the liberty to to use imagination. Is that uh, it? Shouldn't look like somewhere you've just been it needs to look like somewhere else. And the other thing that gives me license is the amount of time spent in these sets. So if you're in a set for only a minute and a half, it needs to look very different from somewhere else. That said, I still base it on um, research, but we sometimes exaggerate that uh, research. And also sometimes, sometimes tone it down a little. For example, mm -hmm. Diana, um, the, 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 the sort of um, analogy I use is, um, is if you look at photographs of Diana's apartment, it looks so of the period that it would be distracting to put, to put uh, Elizabeth Debicki in there. Yeah. Um, um, it's almost like, uh, I suppose the costume equivalent would be shoulder pads. We have to reduce the size of the shoulder pads. <laughs> 
Yeah. Otherwise, people aren't going to believe it. They're going to think they're watching Dynasty. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I'll ask you a couple of awards questions before we go. So you've been nom nominated every season so far, and you won for season three for the unreal Abathon. Um, mm -hmm. What is that experience like to, to uh, win that Emmy for this particular project? It's it's an absolute thrill. It's lovely to be, you know, it's great that the crown still feels current, but people are still interested in talking about it. And the great thing about it is, and I, I think the reason for that is that we are getting closer and closer to the present day, that it moves through time. It's not, uh, it's something that moves through a decade of season roughly. Mm -hmm. And therefore people are keen to know what happens, even though they know uh, history it tells them you know what's going to happen uh, but they're keen to, to see it happen um, and I'm keen to make it look as if it happens in places that people believe um, in places that people haven't seen before um, and another thing is you know one of the challenges I think of um, I don't that this is a slight digression from your, your question is is the introduction of Mohammed Al Fayed and uh, and to and to to know that wealth takes many different forms. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to you know to portray a different kind of unimaginable wealth um, without without parodying him without yeah. without making oh look this is the, the royal family have got this fantastic wealth isn't it beautiful and now this vulgarian tries to well you don't want to do that you really don't want to do that i, I want to respect him um uh, and not exaggerate his his taste if you like yeah but to do it but to, to still make it different from the from the royal family well, I must say, apart from episode six, that third episode about the Alpha Heads is just unbelievable. I just loved it so much. And the design on that is, you could have chosen that as well. Yeah. Um, final uh, question. Thank you. 25 years ago, you won the Oscar for Shakespeare in Love. You haven't aged a bit. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And Use the laughter. Was... <laughs> I, 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 I choose what? to believe you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, good. I'm glad. Um, what first comes to mind when you think about that moment up on stage winning the Oscars? It's the probably the pinnacle of most designers' career. Yeah, uh, it was. It was. A, I mean, it cannot not be a thrill. Um, the first thing you do is you do hug people around you, not because you've seen it happen on the Oscars before, but because you feel like doing it. <laughs> and, and then I was advised to, um, when I was standing on stage to give the speech. Pretend you're talking to only one person, focus on one person in the audience. And so I thought I'd just cast my eyes around and it was Warren Beatty. Anyway, there was Warren Beatty. So I addressed my speech to Warren Beatty. Wow. That's that one of my bingo card for the day, but I'm that's a really nice little uh, anecdote for winning the Oscar. <laughs> Martin, congrats on some beautiful work over five years. This season has been so great. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>